So I want to talk a little bit about the challenge of being funny without being offensive or, or the notion of offense in, mm -hmm. in comedy, because I think there's a, a misimpression that people who don't know how the sausage is made uh, have, which is, you know, I guess two things. One is that you don't really know where the line is and, until you cross it. Mm -hmm. and dial back right like you don't know what people are going to find too offensive until you bump up against the edge of it and sort of roll it back yeah and there's also just uh, a really fine line between funny and offensive there's like the, the the classic louis joke where he says the word jew is either a racial slur or totally okay <laughs> or the word, correct word yeah just depending yeah. on how you pronounce it yeah and that's true of I mean, that's true of phrases. That's true of, of ideas, like how you present something. There's very subtle differences that can be the difference between a hilarious joke and an, and an offensive joke. Mm -hmm. And then there's the final point, which a lot of people don't know. And I, I'm curious if you would agree with this, which is that in most cases, comics do not know which jokes are going to be funny until they utter them for the first time in front of an audience that is it's a thousand kind of percent a true. shoot that is a thousand yeah. percent true that is the most true thing in the world yeah and you and it, oh sorry go ahead i was gonna say it's like it's like true of music too right like we, we all know what the hits are in retrospect but mm -hmm. there are these great stories of like al green did not think let's stay together was going to be a hit he was like i right. don't know this song kind of sounds i feel like it's not my best and can you it, it, and drake didn't know god's plan was going to be a hit mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. And in uh, retrospect, you're like, everyone knows it's a hit. Radiohead's uh, Creep by Radiohead was released twice. It was released yeah. by a single. It did absolutely nothing. Then it was released again on the album and became a huge hit. Right. So, and, yeah, and jokes are know. like that. They are absolutely like that. And I, I have honestly, I stunned myself, you know, through the course of my comedy career, how I didn't really get much better at that. I got a little better at guessing. You know, there mm. are some things you can kind of key in on, but I never got good at guessing literally the only way to do it is to tell it in front of an audience. That's one of the reasons when you see a TV show, those audiences are so amped up and it's a good goddamn thing because th they will laugh at anything and they have to, because all those jokes are, you know, more or less, I mean, you had rehearsal, but more or less first run. Mm. Yeah. You never figure it out. You never get a good, or at least a, a completely accurate horse sense for what's going to work and what's not. You absolutely have jokes where you uh, sort of like you described, you're thinking like, oh, this is killer. Oh, I, fi I finally done it. You know, this is this is my moment of inspiration. This is like when Paul McCartney woke up with yesterday in my head. This this is that. And then you go and you do it at a show and the audience just goes, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And you throw it away and you never use it again. Again, um, that happens all the time. And it does affect like how edgy you can be because you're right. Being taboo like, that's funny. That's one of the th breaking taboos is one of the funniest things you can do mm -hmm. if you do it right. And if you go to a comedy club, you'll see this. One of the funniest things that happen is can happen is that a comic will will go there and talk about things that don't normally talk about. Mm -hmm. A big part of the fuel in the laughter bonfire at a comedy club. It's very often very proper, very subdued women in their 50s and 60s laughing really fucking hard at dirty sex stuff mm -hmm. because their life just doesn't involve them talking about things right. in that way. And then the comic gets on stage and talks about it. And then they just, it's like liberating. They're like losing their shit yeah. because somebody's breaking that taboo. That's a real <laughs> thing. You know, and then there's the cheap way to do it. Much like there's a cheap way to do clapter. Like you can just get up and think, you know, list off the dirtiest things you can think of. And that's not funny because you're cheating. But yeah, breaking taboos is a big thing. And when somebody does it properly, it's really, really funny. And that is one of the reasons that this, you know, chilling atmosphere that is kind of descending over comedy or has descended over comedy, however you want to look at it. That's why it it makes that proposition a lot riskier because you don't know where the line is. You don't know where the line is. There's this gigantic fuzzy range of where the line might be. And that range exists not only for the comic, but also for the audience, because the audience, if, if the comic starts tiptoeing into areas where the audience isn't sure if they should be going. Then the audience is going to clam up and they're, it's sort of the opposite of like, hey, give it up for teachers thing. 
it's sort of like, oh, I don't even know. I don't even know if you should be talking about this. So we're just, no, please move on to something else. It makes it so the range of stuff you can talk about is just, it's just a lot more narrow than it used to be. And therefore the taboo breaking is a lot less and it, it leads to just kind of safe comedy. And this is the, the article you're referring to on my sub stack is um, called how the religious left is turning comedy into Christian rock. And I do feel that it's kind of the same thing. Cause again, I'm from a religious area and a lot of people where I grew up, like they're into Christian rock and the promise of Christian rock is that it's super safe. And that's becoming in some cases, the promise of comedy as well. It's super safe. We're not going to go outside these bounds. We're not going to break any taboos or challenge anything. And personally, I think you're, you know, taking a lot of stuff that's potentially funny off the table. So my, my sense, though, is that that's not actually happening yet because people, you know, like so long as there's any semblance of freedom, the comics mm -hmm. and there's always going to be a big demand for comics who break those taboos, because as you, as you pointed out, breaking taboos is a constitutive element of comedy, right? It's mm -hmm. not like right. breaking taboos is sometimes happens to be funny. Yeah, it's like you know, part of the definition of funny or one of the core elements of funny yeah. is precisely breaking taboos. It's, it's what salt is to cooking. You kind of got to right. have it. Yeah. Right. So, and I think, you know, you know, if, if Netflix doesn't want to give Andrew Schultz a deal or something, he, he, he'll get huge on YouTube. So, so far as there isn't some, isn't a blanket censorship across the board. Yeah. People right. are just going to pop up on, uh, on other platforms because there's going to be a hunger. It's going to create a hunger for that kind of taboo breaking comedy oh, yeah. that will pop up. And in my experience at places like the comedy cellar where, and I, this is increasingly the norm for comedy clubs where they take your phone at the door and put it in a, in a sealed bag. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. comics really have no reason to fear that if they if they do fuck up, if they do cross yeah. a line in one show, it's not going to ruin their careers. They're not going to get canceled for it. Yeah. Um, the jokes, I think, are just as taboo breaking as, as they ever were. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you, I think you're making a great advertisement for the comedy seller mm -hmm. because for people who, you know, don't live in New York and aren't, um, you know, don't know this world closely. By the way, the comedy seller, for people who don't know, that's the room you saw at the beginning of Louie. When Louis, the show Louis on FX, mm -hmm. when he would get off the subway and get the slice of pizza and go into a comedy club, he's going into the comedy cellar. Yeah. And it very much has that uh, that vibe in New York of it is still the rules are a little different in the comedy cellar than they are in other other parts of the world. I mean, there are lots of good clubs, but um, in that, yeah, the, the taboo breaking is still very much part of what's on the menu there. Um, the phone thing, by the way, is, is it's partly because, yeah, I mean, somebody will try to cancel you for anything and it's silly, but it's also because comics are like working, they're working material out. So they don't want somebody tape. And this is like a totally reasonable concern. They don't want somebody taping a half written bit and then posting it on the Internet and going, wow, this famous person isn't really funny. It's like, well, yeah, this is because the bit's not done yet. When, yeah. when you see them do it on HBO, it'll be finished. Right. Um, but I do think you make a really good point about, you know, these kind of currents that, you know, I talk about sometimes we've been talking about here, other people, I'm far from the only person to notice that it does seem to be getting a little bit puritanical sometimes mm -hmm. in comedy. Yeah, those are currents that exist, but they're, you know, they don't dominate every space and they don't dominate the comedy seller and they don't dominate other spaces. And you're right that there's a thirst for taboo breaking sometimes and, you know, stuff that doesn't necessarily play by the rules. If you're trying to figure out why Joe Rogan is so enormous, certainly part of the answer is he doesn't give a fuck about any of those tab taboos. And, you know, people find that refreshing. That's one of the yeah. reasons he's been able to build an audience. And, Bill and Burr, I try Andrew Schultz, a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I, I try to, you know, on on my sub stack, I try to, you know, play by the rules that I think are fair. Uh, you know, I obviously have to stand behind whatever I write. But, uh, you know, there are some <laughs> sometimes I trust my audience to just know, like, it's a joke. You'll, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think you can in 99% of cases, you can trust people to be adults and no one a joke is a joke. Right. Uh, I mean, so one of the things that I think perpetually insulates comedy from censorship mm -hmm. is that laughter is far more honest 
and tamper proof than praise for your argument, right? If you make an argument that deep down I don't agree with, mm -hmm. but I feel enormous pressure to agree with, it's very easy to fake agree with you, right? Yeah. If you're a comic and, and, and you know, what, what's even more important, it's easier to fake disagree with you, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're, if you're mm -hmm. making a totally valid logical point that goes against my politics, mm -hmm. it's trivially easy for my mind to just give me this aversive reaction to what you're saying bypass mm -hmm. the logical part of my brain and just like <laughs> fuck you fuck this and and basically to not concede it's very easy to not concede a good point it's yeah. virtually impossible to not laugh at a funny joke even yeah. if that joke goes against all of your sort of political biases so i i mean i've this has happened to me countless times and it's, it's also happened to people I know with really woke politics, for instance, mm -hmm. where it's like a comedian will make a joke and the direction of that joke politically is the opposite of everything you believe. Yeah, right. But right. it's, so, and it's not a preachy joke. It's just an extremely clever joke. Mm -hmm. And you can't help yourself. You're just laughing because it's so funny, even though you disagree with the underlying point that's being made. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're, you know, you're making me want to go back to stand up because <laughs> I haven't <laughs> I haven't done stand up since COVID. Um, but you're right that um, that that feeling of involuntary laughter, of legitimate laughter, where like you put it, you, you couldn't not laugh if you were trying. Mm -hmm. That is uh, that is such a freeing feeling. And I feel like that happens most often. I would say live comedy is probably the best venue for that because stand up to me is a weird thing. I mean, there's so much bad stand up out there. Right? Well, mm. There's a name for this. Somebody has this yeah. quote: "Ninety percent of everything is crap." Right. Uh, I forget that. That's like somebody's postulate, mm -hmm. but it sounds to me like one of the most true things in the world, and that is true, including of stand up. But god damn it, when stand up is good, live stand up comedy, you've had exactly the right number of drinks, something in the two to three range, so you can still follow it, but you're feeling a little bit yeah you know, oh, there's certainly there's a bell curve there you can go yeah. way too far with the drinks but mm -hmm. um yeah when you're in that sweet spot and the comic is good you i mean that is the hardest you will laugh in your life that is the hardest you will laugh in your life i remember you know again that dave Chappelle show i remember doing that at lewis black i remember doing that at Patton oswald i mean it's it's mm -hmm. you you're out of control mm -hmm. and it's it's freeing and it's enormously fun and what you're describing, what I, what I was thinking about, that, that's an interesting point, by the way. I, I hadn't heard that point you just made about how sort of the laughter is involuntary, but the uh, choosing to agree or disagree is voluntary. It's those seem like polar opposite states of being <laughs> to me, like the one where you are, you know, gripped with laughter and you can't stop and it's just happening to you. And it's, you know, you're in convulsions versus uh a state of being where you're you're measured and you're controlled and you're thinking very strategically about what you say next and what you do next is like god that sounds like a type of prison right and you know we all live in the second state for you know a good good portion of our life you know maybe not that extreme but like we do have to be living in a society here and be polite to each other and that's good but i don't want to live in that all the time and uh certainly when i walk into a comedy club and buy two two drinks minimum I would like to be freed from that straitjacket.